Hello, and thank you for joining our discussion on Evidence Workplace. We welcome Professor Neil Greenberg from, oh, I believe that's my, no, sorry, Professor Neil Greenberg from March of Stress, and Davina McDonald, who will be providing a case study from the Home Office. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Um, thanks very much for um, coming to our session. Um, we hope we've got an interesting 35-minute slot, uh, and um, you can see our, our title up there. What we're going to do just to start off is just to very briefly say who we are. Um, so my name is Neil, uh, Neil Greenberg. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, my background is I served in the uh, Royal Navy for about 23 and a half years, I left about five years ago. Um, and then I do, a, I think, what's called a portfolio career. The, the reality is it means bits and pieces. Uh, doing some academic work down at King's College London, run a small little company and do lots of work to do with uh, military veterans uh, and the like. And Davina, do you want to? Um, yep, so I'm Davina McDonald Russell. Um, I was actually with the uh, Home Office for 13 years. Um, I've actually taken a career change in the past few months. I'm now working with uh, BNT as a, as a project consultant. Um, but I also have uh, operational experience as a prison officer. I've actually worked in an immigration detention center. Um, and my actual motivation for this type of work is driven by uh, my husband and my father in law having depression and anxiety. And also, uh, almost six years ago, I had a significant neurological illness, which, with the help of many, many different types of strategies, I managed to overcome. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so you've obviously heard lots of great presentations and great stories today, and you'll know that um, people who don't um, turn up for work obviously are, uh, causes difficulties for the individuals and also causes difficulties for the organisation. You may well have heard of the term um, presenteeism, which describes people being at work in body but not being uh, at work in, in their mind. And actually, in terms of uh, loss to industry, that's a far bigger loss than actually people not turning up for work. And I guess my interest in, in making sure that the mental health of people at work um, is as good as it possibly can be comes from the fact is, as a doctor, I'm interested in people, but having been in the military, it's also making commanders, you know, people in charge, um, interested in getting the best out of their people. Um, and sadly, when things go wrong sometimes, they go wrong in spades. Uh, and sometimes people who have mental health difficulties, there are there's just some pictures up here of air crashes and German wings and um, Sergeant Blackman and other such things, is where, where, where things go wrong in, in safety critical environments particularly, then actually the outcomes can be, can be pretty serious. You know, so mental health isn't just about being good to people, sometimes it's absolutely uh, a key part of health and safety. So in the, in the world that, that I work in, um, you know, stress comes from many sources. It can come from home life, from work life. But also there are, there are organizations out there that routinely um, deal with traumatic material as part of their everyday life. So you, the military is one, but so is the emergency services. So are many healthcare staff, child social workers, you know, media professionals. So there's a large group of people who have trauma as a routine part uh, of their daily work. And uh, that, too, can impact upon their mental health as well as uh, other stresses. Now, if you have a physical health injury, hopefully um, you go to get some health care, uh, you get um, healed, whatever that term might mean, and, and you return to work. And in many cases, it, it can be quite simple. So in theory, if you have a mental health difficulty, the answer should be you go and get some care, you get healed, and you go back to work. But as we've heard today, and as many of you will um, be aware yourself, there are many, many reasons that this doesn't work. Yeah, and I'm just going to put up here just some of the li little examples of things. You know, people fail, for instance, to recognize that what they have is a mental health problem. Uh, and you've heard some fabulous stories today of people who will have said exactly that. People worry about their careers. Um, it's quite hard sometimes to, to get mental health care. Um, you'll, you'll be aware that the, the NHS provides some fabulous care but at times it can be pretty hard to, to get in and, and get it. And particularly for people who work in, in institutions or in organisations that have a particular culture, like the emergency services or the police or probably the home office as well, sometimes you find that if you go and get care, people, the therapist isn't speaking the same language. Um, I do a talk about, entitled, Do You Speak Veteran? And so veterans have a whole different language. You know, if someone says, oh, 
is that a Gucci watch? They don't actually mean that watch is made by Gucci. They mean it's a nice watch. And there's lots of other very funny things that veterans talk in a very, very different way. And there's, there's loads of reasons why people don't go and get the care that, that they, they, they might benefit from. So um, I've spoken a bit about the emergency services and, and uh, the, the, the military and the like. And you might think that all these kind of rather roughly tufty type organizations, they have a stiff upper lip. But actually, the rest of society is better. So this is data from a study done across England in 2007, and this looked at the rates of mental health in, in the English population. It was a really good study. I would say that as a professor, I'm quite excited by these things. Um, and so all these people in this study had post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And what you can see here, actually, is we thought that veterans wouldn't be getting help and everyone else would be getting much more help. In fact, it makes no difference. You know, not seeking help for a mental health problem is a societal issue. It's not just one restricted to the police or to veterans or the like. However, we do know people do come and get help. And so we did a study where we spoke to a number of veterans who had come and got care. And we said, how did you get here? Hoping they weren't going to say in a taxi or something like that. And we find that the two biggest reasons that people finally decide to get care is that something bad has happened. You know, be it a road traffic accident, be it being caught drunk driving be it telling your boss what to think of them, which is probably never a good idea, um, or that a significant other, often their spouse, but not always, has said, if you don't get help, then I'm going to leave, that's enough, blah, blah, blah. So people do get help, but they get help at the last possible moment. And wouldn't it be good news if they could get help much earlier on, much further upstream? Um, where do people get help from? This is a study we did with a group of military personnel who had deployed to the former Yugoslavia um, some years ago. And when they came back from deployment, we said, who did you speak to about your difficulties? And 97% said I spoke to people who were like me, who've been on the same deployment, who speak the same language. The military has a, uh, a mental health uh, um, facility, but only 8% of people go and see them. Most people, and you've heard this message today many times, prefer to speak to their colleagues, people who, who talk the same language. Um, and so there's some, there's some important lessons here, is that we know that people don't seek um, support for mental health problems at, at a good time. Uh, we know that actually they prefer to speak to their colleagues. So the question is, what can we do to make that collegial support as good as it possibly could be? Well, back in the late 1990s, the Royal Marines um, first started to get interested in mental health. And, and I can tell you the main reason they were getting interested is they were worried that they were losing too many Marines uh, because of mental health difficulties. And so what got developed was a system of training up frontline Marines, chefs, uh, helicopter pilots, you know, people who were not health professionals at all in being able to identify um, whether their colleagues had got difficulties. And I ran some of these first courses. It wasn't called, um, the system's called TRIM, which stands for Trauma Risk Management. It wasn't called TRIM back then. It didn't really have a name, actually. Um, and we would lecture to groups of sergeant majors about mental health. Now, for those of you who ever worked either in or with the military, you'll know that the average sergeant major is not your most psychologically minded individual that you might meet. And these courses would go on for a couple of days. And we were really kind of concerned at first, but we, need, we didn't need to be concerned. These people who have been in the military for a long time, they had plenty of experience of seeing people who have been affected by mental health problems. They might not have called them that, but they absolutely had seen it before. And the reason that peer support in the Marines took off was because the junior management, the sergeant majors, they made it happen. We could convince them it was a good thing, but if we didn't have their support, it would have made no difference. It was quite easy to get the brigade commander, the person in charge, to sign it off. But actually, that's all very nice, but that doesn't make it work. The pe so the middle managers were absolutely key. And what we did with TRIM, which is this peer support system we developed in the, in, in the military, which now has rolled out across the whole of the military, it's used by the Foreign Office, by the BBC, many police forces use it as well, is, is we, we didn't just say, oh, here's a good system. We carried out an awful lot of research on it. We've now done 14 scientific papers looking at TRIM in a variety of different organisations, emergency services, diplomats, military and the like. And TRIM is, has been shown time and time again that it, it's not penicillin for trauma. So this is not a way of preventing people becoming unwell, but it's a really effective, credible system that makes a positive difference. So based upon that, we had this system that was set up to deal with trauma in the military. But of course, many organizations, thankfully, don't deal with trauma on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So we took all the learning from TRIM and we developed a system that we call STRAW, which stands for Sustaining Resilience at Work. And it's exactly the same principle. It's taking frontline staff who have a day-to-day -day job and training them and giving them the skills to be able to have a structured conversation with one of their colleagues and identify whether they might have any difficulties. And importantly, then taking some positive actions with them to try and help them improve their situation. So the idea about STRAW is you would, uh, the STRAW course takes about two days. Uh, where You train up people who, who are in the workplace who are enthusiastic, and you give them the skills to carry out these structured conversations. This is the checklist that we use in, uh, from someone who's, who's been on the STRAW training course. If, for those of you who are interested in the science type stuff and the health and safety legislation, what they do is use this 10-point checklist that is based upon really good science. So we've got lots of evidence that all these risk factors predict that people might have difficulties. So a colleague sits down, has a structured conversation with you, and uses this as a checklist, as a guide, to help them identify whether someone might have a difficulty or not. And what they do after that is they then use the score they make, they generate, to put, place someone in their head on this spectrum. So if someone's green, they've got a few snags, nothing serious going on, simple bit of advice, and, and you know, by all means, they can come back. If someone's yellow, maybe they're not sleeping quite so uh, well as they used to, concentration a little bit off, but nothing serious. If they're amber, quite a lot's going on here. They're a bit more shouty at home. Uh, they've missed a couple of deadlines. They've probably drunk more alcohol than they should do. Or maybe they're red. Actually, they're sleeping terribly. Their wife walked out on them the other day, um, and they're thinking about handing their job in. And actually, they may have some far more serious and worrisome thoughts as well. The straw practitioners aren't making a diagnosis. They're merely trying to have an understanding of their colleagues' state of mental health and where they are on that spectrum. And this is all too complicated. We won't go into this in any detail. But what it allows them to do is to decide what actions to take to help get someone back to green. So someone who's yellow, may need some simple mentoring. They may need to go and speak to their boss about uh, taking the, the, the leave that they haven't taken for a while. They may need to uh, get out and do a bit more exercise, do some tweaks. Someone who's amber needs to take some positive action now, because if they don't take positive action, then actually they may slip into red. And someone who's red, they need to get to a professional. So the straw practitioner would metaphorically put their arm around them and say, come on, I think we need to get you to go and see someone who can actually do a proper check. So that's the process uh, that a straw practitioner would, would, would take. What, what can a straw practitioner do to try and help their colleagues get back towards green? Well, we teach two main techniques. One of them is called problem-solving therapy, which is as basic as it sounds. But there's a great adage, which is that people in crisis problem-solve badly. So how many times have you not been able to find your car keys or your door keys? You check your pocket and it's empty. You search around a bit more, but then you check your pocket again, just in case somehow the keys have somehow magically appeared. When we're in a bit of a crisis, we don't think well. So having a colleague sit down and talk through what the situation is and what some simple problem-based solutions might be can make a big difference. And the other thing we teach is what's called decisional balance. It's a technique that actually comes from something called motivational interviewing, which is used with people with addictions. And the idea of decisional balance is that when someone's not doing an action that might help them, taking some leave, speaking to their boss about their, their difficulties, um, speaking to their partner and the like, is saying what you should do is A, B, and C doesn't tend to help. We don't tend to take advice very easily. What decisional balance technique does is help the person use their own words, get them to think about the pros and cons of taking action and the pros and cons of not taking action. And if you get them to talk through the, those four boxes, taking action, not taking action uh, in both ways, then what you get is a statement that says, actually, if you put it like that, I should take help. I, I should take some action to, to, to make a positive difference. And if you think about what motivation is, motivation is the pressure between what you want to do and what you are doing. If your life's pretty rubbish and you really want your life to be good, the bigger the difference between those two things, the more likely you are to take positive action. So we train our, our straw practitioners to be able to do that. So in summary, we developed this system originally called TRIM, which is a peer support system in the military. We took all that training, which was based upon trauma and battlefields and, and unpleasantness, and we 
took that all and we put it into the store training package, which is delivered to organizations that work in a whole range of different challenging organizations. And it's much more focused on day-to-day -day stressors uh, at work and at home. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, essentially, I was in the Home Office, um, and because of the challenges that I had, I got interested in diversity and inclusion and that sort of thing, and my ears pricked up because I heard someone say, I've heard about something called STRAW, Sustaining Resilience at Work, you know, and so, kind of probed a bit and said, you know, what is it? And they were, they were talking about it's something which empowers individuals and helps people get back on track after they've experienced challenges. So I, I just thought, actually, this is something which I'm generally interested in. I just said, I'm, I'm here, let me, let me take it on, let me lead it. Didn't know anything about it at the time. So essentially, then started to get to know uh, Neil Greenberg's company, March on Stress, and arranged the very first training course. Now, just to outline, I was at the time working in the Office for Security and Counterterrorism. Uh, that's a department within the Home Office. Um, and a lot, of, um, a lot of us were DB trained. We did a lot of work with uh, intelligence agencies, military, police, and that sort of thing. Very fast-paced work. So looking at the challenge, we're looking at high-profile activity. I mean, you've all seen the Home Office in the press pretty frequently, I, I would guess. Um, we had uh, challenges because of security constraints. So people would be working on something for, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm developed vetted. I'm working on this top-secret document. Who can I talk to? Um, we had health-related absences, like many organizations. Um, but also, uh, there's quite a lot of trends regarding people who needed adjustments in the workplace. So thinking about all of that's a challenge, I actually saw this as a massive opportunity. And critically, I was thinking, this is about empathy here. This is about peers empowering other peers to actually you know, get back on track and take control over situations. Um, I desperately wanted to break away from normal I don't like doing the thing normal, but so often you hear about normal working patterns and, um, you know, oh, actually, you know, this isn't normal for this person to, to need these adjustments on this desk or, oh, they've asked for a particular time off. It's like, what does the policy say? So I was desperate to actually start getting um, the, the organisation to think about everyone as individuals. But also, we realised there are myths around the employee assistance programme. It's just a tick box exercise. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to bother, you know, that sort of stuff. So we thought, actually, we've got this, this programme. Let's actually probe and bust some myths about it so we can be more descriptive. Um, but also, there was a fear about occupational health, particularly with people coming back after long-term sick. People did actually fear being referred to occupational health because does it mean they're going to medically retire me? Does it mean I won't be able to do the job that I really like doing, I want to get back to? And do, will, it, will this sort of thing, will it mean I can't work within these security constraints? Does it mean I won't be trusted? So then, took it on as the aim um, to, yeah, empower these individuals, but contribute to that reduction in that mental health-related absences because, you know, I was recognising colleagues that were saying, I can't, I can't cope anymore. Actually, no, I'm just going to go off sick. I just need to get a break from here. So they saw no other option. But I wanted to start increasing morale as well because there's very much something which we call the urgency spiral, um, particularly in OSCT and other departments in the Home Office, where particular incidents happen. Um, for example, you'll have Salisbury and then you'll have Westminster. and you know, All these incidents happen which are external to the organisation, but it means that teams have to get stood up to deal with it. And it's a question of what's sustainable. But also, we wanted to get to people talking about mental health-related topics in the workplace. And by that, I mean everybody. OK, so you will see the panda. Uh, I'm going to come to that, that shortly. But I took this very much as a project management approach, because that was my day job. Um, so this is work that I actually did as a volunteer. I, I just wanted to get it done. So I, like my action plans, developed all of that. But it was crucial for me that it was going to be a sustainable management structure. So it's not just a case of getting eight people trained up and then saying, off you go. It's about having a management structure so you know who those individuals are and you know, what frame of mind they're in, what skills they have, are they available, um, and that's, that sort of thing. It was crucial that we were going to be accessible to people across the organisation and by that, I mean different geographical locations, um, different working patterns, 
uh, people working operational shifts or working through the night. Also, um, we had a significant number of colleagues with visual impairments and a number of colleagues who didn't like speaking face to face. So we wanted to make sure we were as accessible as we, as we possibly could be. And I'm going to bang on about it, but it's crucial. The focus was to make sure that actually it wasn't about telling individuals what to do. It was about saying, actually, how can we help you get back on track? A crucial part of, of the journey um, with Straw was to start with, because you know, I was looking for funding and you know, home office departments, government you know, money, and I started off being very corporate, so you know, doing the business cases and everything like that. So immediate posters were very much two individuals sitting down and you know, saying, come and talk to a confidential network. Um, and it, it's quite strange, actually, but I actually identified pandas with something which appealed to a large number of people. Um, and also, everyone just likes a panda when they, when they see them. It makes people smile. It's gender neutral. You know, and, and I thought, and I was going somewhere with this. So we actually developed um, a unique brand of the pandas. We then produced them on posters. Uh, we actually got lanyards made up, which also identified straw practitioners, but also mental health first aiders. And that was actually approved by the permanent secretary. So we actually got something like that <laughs> um, approved, you know, which was actually a massive step for us. Um, and we developed a straw web page. And the reason for that was to make sure that we had a library where we could direct people to. Because like many organizations, there's so many emails going around, mailboxes get, get full up. And we thought, well, actually, let's start targeting people so that they can actually go to one place. That's where they can access information on the team. But also, that's where they can start accessing some of the sources of information that we started gathering. So just to warn you about cute panda alert. Now, in all seriousness, the messages on these posters actually came from when my husband actually started opening up about how how he actually felt when he had his attacks of depression and anxiety. These are just snippets, and I do have a whole suite more. But things like the running on empty needs help planning the next step. There's just too much going on. He just wanted to hide away, struggling to stay afloat. So I devised a whole, a whole suite of these posters based on things that he said um, really were significant to him. And the interesting thing is that as soon as I started rolling these out, they went up in absolutely every team area at possible. And it's even better because I printed and double-sided, and you see people turning around when their days are turning. But crucially, this got people talking out loud. But also, everyone would start identifying with the messages on them as well. So this is all, all part of the, uh, the journey that I was taking them on. An absolutely crucial part of embedding straw and making it a success were actually looking after the practitioners themselves. And, and we have had this spoken about today that look, you have to look after yourself as the first aider first. You know, we heard about you put the mask on yourself before you help your child. But actually, you don't know exactly what cases your colleagues are going to be taking on when they go and speak to an individual. Um, we had a whole range of cases, so you know, um, I, my, one of my quickest uh, literally was about three minutes, and the individual just wanted to tell me they'd been diagnosed with, a, with an illness, and they just wanted to tell somebody. On the other hand, there are cases which are so complicated and can involve eight or more concurrent strands um, of information and challenges, which can equally be impactful on, on the practitioner. So a crucial part of this was making sure that we had the practitioners with good sound knowledge, but also knowledge of who they could go to as well if they felt they didn't know where to signpost individuals to. We also made sure that we did pre-briefs before they spoke uh, to colleagues in challenge, and we also did uh, debriefs. Now, these didn't breach confidentiality, but it was about checking in and it's about making sure the practitioner was going to clear their mind before committing uh, that, to that coaching session with the, with the individual. And when you're in a fast-paced environment, uh, such as the home office, 
it's, you cannot go from a meeting straight into a, a coaching session, a referral. You cannot do it. So it was about having that, that overarching control. We had a confidential tracker. And this is where it was taking us into the organizational trend space. Because the tracker didn't have any personal details on it, but we could identify where, what particular types of conversations were taking place, if external events were actually impacting significantly. So for example, in Manchester and Grenfell, we saw a spike in people coming to us for help. But we also saw a spike in things including a larger number of colleagues being diagnosed with dyslexia and dyspraxia, so in their 40s. Um, so that was throwing up quite a few things. Um, and also, this is where we identified the fear of occupational health, the employee assistance program. So we could identify the, the areas that we needed to focus on in terms of making sure that uh, the sources of support were a lot more available. Another crucial factor was if a practitioner said they needed a timeout, Absolutely. If they need to step away for a couple of days or a few weeks or months, not a problem. It was equally looking after them as well as looking after the colleagues that we actually um, helped out. So I said when I started this work that if, if I could actually help uh, one individual, for me it was going to be worth it. Because I was thinking about personal experiences, the challenges that um, I had in terms of my return to work, the stigma that my husband encountered in terms of the workplace. So we thought, if we can help one individual actually have a less challenging time as a result of our intervention, great. So these are genuine uh, testimonials. I have got a lot more. Actually, some of them are really detailed, so I haven't got the space. But there's a couple, particularly the, I feel really good now. I feel I can get back to operational work once again. And for any of you who know what operational work is, is like, that was a massive step change to this individual. Um, it's about the listening factor. And crucially, one of the skills you need as a practitioner is if it takes it, you need to be able to sit there for 45 minutes and not say a word. So it really is about that listening factor. So you know, brilliant to see that. I feel so much better now, started in a new job. You know, how positive is that? You know, some, someone comes to us feeling down, and then they've taken the positive move and they're actually enjoying the work. I mean, that's absolutely fantastic. And then I'm going to talk about how we branched into teams, but we've got um, testimonials about resilience sessions that we then tailored for teams. Um, and the fact is that we actually started getting this recognized as something that uh, OSCT as a department was proud of and has actually spread into at least four other departments. So we took the straw piece, which was helping those individuals out, you know, using the techniques that Neil outlined, but also we targeted managers and we targeted teams. And it was interesting here because individuals said, can you come and talk to my team? And then as a result of the manager and team sessions, can I come and talk to you as an individual? So it, it was an interesting two-way um, progression that we made there. But also that helped us to really uncover some of the underlying causes of some of those urgency spirals that I talked about earlier. We saw people starting to talk a lot more about mental health across the organization. And by this, I mean from every single level. After the Manchester and Grenfell incidents, that was the first time I saw uh, directors actually saying on stage, I have mental health challenges. You know, we want, we want you all to feel comfortable. We want to make sure you've all got somewhere to go to. And it was absolutely fantastic to actually see Straw being up there as one of the forefront services that, that directors were really, really galvanizing support for. I've mentioned the identification of organizational trends. So we could then escalate these senior managers to say that we need to have more activity. So for example, with the dyslexia dyspraxia piece, you know, we need to have more awareness um, sessions built up for line managers because this isn't the case of an individual who's been lazy, there's genuine reasons why the quality of the work's not there. Um, so it's, it's interesting how you, you can put all of this information together. But because we had this, this overarching structure, senior managers would actually listen to us. And, and then taking some of those testimonials as well, make sure they were all anonymized, also kind of really, really lent the credibility of the initiative. 
we all talk about people plans and people surveys, but actually it's a proud moment when the work that you've done has shaped that people plan strategically. Um, because also this is something which was being driven by colleagues for other colleagues. It wasn't in response to a star survey. It was genuine motivation to actually get something out there which could hopefully benefit colleagues. And, and the 200 plus is a really you know, significant achievement. So this is um, kind of shows you the stages of what I've just talked about. But critically as well, it shows how we were working with individuals and teams. But from there, that's where the cross-department knowledge sharing came into it. I was attending buddy groups in different departments. They were coming to some of our meetings. But also from that, that's how the straw concept has grown. So it's not just in OECT now. The Crime, Fire and Policing Group, UK Visas International, the Ministry for uh, Communities and Local Governments, um, and actually I'm pretty sure there's a couple of others on your waiting list. Um, but actually that shows that it was being driven as something which is really, really working. Um, but, and then it comes into the uh, organisational people plan, but also we put it into a wider resilience of wellbeing programme. So STRAW was one concept of that. STRAW has definitely proven to be a successful concept. And it's particularly with some of the techniques that you use, you essentially are handing the power over to individuals. And it's got the evidence from those that said it stopped them taking time off work. And one of the re really hard things to do is to kind of really get that formidable statistical piece of about how much has benefited the organisation. Um, but the statistics are there to show the basis of that. And that leads me to... Oh, any questions? OK. I think we've got... Shall we stand up and do a double laptop here? So I think we've got time for, for some questions. So we'll take those. Are you aware of any peer support around mental health happening before people enter the workforce in universities and schools? Uh, schools and universities. Um, I, so peer support as a concept goes on all over the place, for, for sure. And I certainly know some of, some of the universities um, have uh, listening systems uh, where they train up other students to, to do that. I guess one of the things about uh, Straw and, and before it trim is that what we tried to do um, is to try and gather evidence about whether this works. Because there are lots of good initiatives that are out there, um, and sometimes that they're, they're good initiatives, but they're not evaluated. And so what I don't know is in schools or universities quite how well evaluated those sort of uh, listening sort of systems are. Anyone up there? Grab you. The, you um, the only thing I'd add on that one, um, just purely because I was doing some work with some charities, and, and actually it's, it's been really interesting to see how much work charities like the YMCA um, are actually doing in terms of peer-to-peer -peer support networks. So it's just something that if you're interested in that, it's well worth looking at what some of those charity organisations are doing. So there's one. Oh, okay. There's a bit. Um, there's one here about: Is there a danger that straw? So where did they go? A, a danger that straw might be trying to sort of provide a diagnosis, and it may um, provide a solution rather than offering support. Well, there's actually really good evidence um, that most people who have um, a degree of mental distress, so they're not ill, but who have mental distress, do not need necessarily having professionals coming coming in to, to talk to them. Certainly in the, in the world of trauma, um, so if something really big and unpleasant happens, there was an old concept where you would bring in psychological uh, experts, you know, psychological debriefers, to talk to people after traumatic events, people who were having a wholly understandable um, distress reaction. And what we know is not only did that not work, that actually made people worse. So our NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellent Guidelines, specifically says you shouldn't do it. So there definitely is a role for people like me, uh, for people who are unwell. But the really strong evidence is that actually having peer support in the workplace and good supervisors and good social support structures is effective at getting people who are distressed back towards a, a state of uh, being green, of being well. What about does resilience discourage wider company change, maybe? Is that... No, and when it comes to resilience, actually, um, I, I deliberately used the word resilience a lot in communications because we actually felt so it lent a lot more weight to what we're doing. It was something about the interpretation of it as being more, more sort of powerful and proactive. So we actually saw that as being um, 
something which was actually encouraging change, actually, because it, it, we've, we are in very changing um, circumstances, particularly some of the, the areas of work and the pace of technology. So I actually think resilience is, a, is an encouraging piece. And, and actually, the important thing on resilience is there's, there's plenty of definitions of resilience out there, but the ones that have the most credibility make it very clear it's not about not being affected by what's going on. It's about the ability to cope and to bounce back. Mm. And I think, whereas in the old days, you know, certainly in the military and the police, you know, the idea would you just keep on taking it and you'd be strong, you know, we now know that that's rubbish. That doesn't you know, exist on the films. It doesn't exist in reality. Resilience is not about being not affected. It's about having the tools internally and amongst your social support networks to be able to bounce back. So I'd hope that it would seem as progressive rather than holding companies back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, yeah, so 200 people, did they access EAP? No, uh, so uh, with regard to this, this was straw, was uh, as a concept, we reached the 200 people. Um, the Employee Assistance Programme actually saw an increase in people going because as practitioners, once we learnt more about the programme and we actually worked more closely with them, we could actually say... You, you know, you've come to us as a brand new parent, you've got challenges, did you know there's a young parents team in the employee assistance programme? So actually we were doing a lot more sort of um, specific guidance away so that they knew it wasn't, as I said, that tip box exercise. Um, but also things like bereavement counselling, uh, the availability of ordinary uh, counselling outside the GP, um, but also the suite of financial advice, the health advice that was on there, um, it was, I have to, I hold my hands up and I was uh, baffled by how much, how little I actually knew about the employee assistance programme, so it's certainly complemented as opposed to replaced. I guess the last question there about how do you encourage people to come forward who are less social to peer support, it's absolutely true, there is no one solution that will work for everybody. Some people will find that speaking to colleagues uh, works for them, and you've heard I think many times today how many people do prefer to speak to, to colleagues. Some people will want to speak to a professional, you know, and, and that's absolutely okay. There's certainly to have an effective system in any uh, uh, employment uh, environment. You have to have a choice of, uh, of options, not just one option. I think we are at time, um, so thank you very much indeed for thank listening. You. Thank you. Thank you.